1991. What a great time to be alive. Seeing movies like Robin Hood and Hook in the theaters and hearing hits like Joyride by Roxette or Losing My Religion by R.E.M. are some of my favorite pop culture memories of that time. Not to mention watching TV shows like Home Improvement, America's Funniest Home Videos, and The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Of course, being 11 years old, my photography experience was limited to disposable cameras, but that might not be the case for you. If you were older or luckier, you might have had one of these classic or innovative cameras I'll be talking about today. Hi everyone, my name is Azrael Knight, and on today's episode of TOC Extra, I'm going to go over the top 10 hottest 35mm cameras you could buy in 1991. A couple of things I want to mention about this list before I get started. I constructed this list with a few parameters in mind. First, I used Popular Photography's top cameras for 1991 as the base for it. Next, I boiled the list down from 20 to 10 by selecting the ones still most relevant today. The higher the number of Google results, the higher it appears on the list. The next one is actually based on your feedback from my last top 10 video on the hottest 35mm cameras of 1982. In this golden age of photography, which is in my opinion 1975 to 1995, many of the cameras released had a very long shelf life. Because of that, if I include older models, my top 10 list could have several of the same entries, even if I jump ahead 9 years. So for that reason, I have put a cap on cameras to be no older than seven years from the year featured. That brings me to the last bit, which is this isn't a list of cameras released in 1991. Rather, it is a list of the hottest cameras you could buy in 1991. As I mentioned, some of these entries have been out for a few years. But with all that being said, let's get started. Number 10, the Ashika 230 AF. The first camera on today's list is the Ashika 230 AF, an early auto exposure camera with three modes plus manual. The 230 AF was announced in 1986, but immediately caused some controversy, as mentioned here in this article by Norman Goldberg, released by Popular Photography in November 1986. Yashka created a stir when the company was forced to withdraw its newest entry in the auto-focusing fray. Called the 230 AF, the camera quickly became the subject of a patent dispute, but not before several German language photo magazines came out with the details on the camera. To satisfy the affronted party, perhaps Minolta, the camera was displayed in a locked showcase. Word is that the matter will be resolved soon. Despite the early controversy, the 230 AF made its debut in 1987. One of the more interesting features was the CS110 AF flash accessory, which fit over the hot shoe and pentaprism to give a seamless appearance. It almost makes it look like another camera. Picking up one of these in 1991 with a flash and a 50mm f1.8 would cost you 765 US or 1536 today. There are not many found on eBay, but if you want one of your own, you can expect to get one for under $100. Number 9, the Olympus IS-1. At number 9 is the Olympus IS-1, a very strange looking camera. Even stranger at the time because cameras like this marked the birth of the bridge model. A camera which included many of the manual and auto exposure modes of an SLR, but with a fixed lens like a point and shoot. Because it didn't fit into an already established category of camera, Olympus dared to make their own, calling it a ZLR or zoom lens reflex. This was absolutely a marketing gimmick, but it seemed to work. The IS-1 garnered a fair amount of attention. In December 1990, Mike Stensvold conducted a thorough review in Peterson's Photographic on the IS-1 and concluded that the Olympus IS-1 comes closer than most to truly being a camera for everybody. In point-and-shoot mode, it's as simple to use as any camera in its class. It offers versatility to the more creative snap shooter, and it's got some advanced features found in few other such cameras, making it useful to the more serious photographers as well. Olympus's goal was centered around the idea that this was a new concept camera and the wave of the future. This three-page ad, published in November 1990, encompasses that notion by posing the question, remember the first time you received a fax? 
talked on a cell phone or heard a CD, in 1991, you could expect to pay $800 or $1,600 in today's money. If you want to buy one used on eBay, they are cheap as chips. I actually did a very detailed history on this camera recently on an episode of This Old Camera that clocks in at almost 33 minutes. In case you want to learn everything there is to know about the Olympus IS-1, I'll leave a link for that in the description. Number eight, the Nikon N8008. Coming in at number 8 is the Nikon N8008, funny how that worked out. A consumer level autofocus SLR with some impressive features for its time, including a 1 8000th of a second max shutter speed and a flash sync speed of 1 over 250. While many camera manufacturers of the time were abandoning their lens mounts from the days of manual focus SLRs, Nikon was staying true to their user base by creating a new autofocus system that could still take older manual focus lenses with a fair amount of compatibility. Peter Burian conducted a field test and wrote about it in the winter 1989 issue of Outdoor and Travel Photography magazine. Though the N8008 is clearly an advanced and sophisticated piece of high-tech engineering, it is exceedingly user-friendly, says Burian. I predict that any photographer who can operate a digital watch or VCR will be familiar with the N8008 and its use within 30 minutes. Peter also says it handles like a dream, but had a couple of hang-ups about its operation. He noted that although the N8008 is capable of continuous autofocus, he nailed more sharp images with the standard AF. The advertising campaign for the N8008 bore the title, The Difficult It Does Automatically, The Impossible Takes a Few More Seconds. Here are a couple of examples from 1989. This one with the ballerina touches on the matrix metering system and rear curtain fill flash. The point is, says the ad, highly creative pictures that used to be difficult to impossible for anyone less than a professional photographer are now within your grasp. The other ad sings a similar tune, stating, Ordinary exposure control systems could be fooled by the dark black sky and overexpose the lighted skyline. A brand new N8008 with the 50mm f1.4 would cost you $960, $1991, or $1928 today. This camera is an unsung hero in today's film photography community and comes in at an incredibly low price of $70 or less with shipping body only. Number seven, the Contax RTS-3. At number seven is the Contax RTS-3. In a time when autofocus was quickly becoming king, the people at Kyocera decided to make a more streamlined, more sophisticated, manual focus SLR. The first thing that people will notice is that the RTS-3 uses Zeiss glass known for their build quality and sharpness. But the thing that reviewers in advertising talked about the most was a feature called RTV or real-time vacuum. In this user report, published by Peterson's Photographic in 1991 and written by Bill Herger, it's explained that the RTV system is engaged when the shutter fires and sort of sucks the film back onto the pressure plate, creating a flatter image thus creating a sharper image. Contax engineers have shown film plane flatness error to exist in current state-of-the-art SLRs to a degree of 20 to 30 microns in extreme cases. Further, the contention is that a 10 micron error in film plane flatness would cause a rear focus displacement of approximately one centimeter in an image shot at a distance of three meters with a Zeiss 85mm f1.4. Basically, you don't buy a Contax RTS-3 for quick focus, but superior focus. 
This 1992 ad titled See Through the Eyes of a Genius gives the reader a visual of what the RTV does to film flatness and showcases the Zeiss glass. Another ad claims that Contax engineers have finally created the world's first 35mm SLR camera for perfectionists. The price on an RTS3 with a 50mm f1.4 would set you back $36.30 in 1991, about $7,300 today. A steep investment for a manual focus camera in a progressively autofocus world, but still not the most expensive manual focus camera on today's list. Number 6. The Minolta Maxim 9000 Number 6 is the Minolta Maxim 9000. In January 1985, Minolta changed photography forever with the Maxim 7000, and 10 months later we were introduced to the 9000. While the 7000 was a model meant for the broadest audience possible, the 9000 geared itself towards the more serious amateur and professional. Professional Autofocus Minolta Alpha 9000 Continuous AF 4000 Spot Sokko Biao Gokoma Motor Drive in May 1986, modern photography had a very extensive look at the Maxim 9000, seeing how it compared to the 7000, which they noted that, indeed its designers not only responded to virtually every criticism we made of the original 7000, they have also created one of the most sophisticated, comprehensive, internally complex, and startlingly original SLR systems the world has ever seen. Popular Photography did their own field test in September 1986, praising the camera, but even when incredibly innovative, a camera is rarely perceived as perfect, and the Maxim 9000 is no exception. Writer Bob Schwalberg had a few complaints for sure, including the average slash spot metering setting didn't have a lock on it, so a sleeve or a strap or whatever would often change metering modes without him realizing it. Also the lack of lens selection. Almost two years after the launching of the Maxim autofocusing camera system, Minolta's AF lineup is heavy on zooms, but short on meat and potatoes workaday optics. At the time of review, they have nothing wider than a 24mm, no 35mm, and not a single zoom in the 50 to 135 range. Advertising claimed the Minolta Maxim 9000 to be the world's most sophisticated camera, and encouraged you to ascend to the height of professionalism. It seemed in this ad released in 1989, one of Bob's issues was resolved, as I'm seeing a 16mm prime and a 35 to 105mm lens. With a 50mm f1.7, a Maxim 9000 would set you back 974 in 1991, or about 1950 today. Number 5, the Leica R6. The Leica R6 comes in at number 5, and while many cameras take a leap forward from one version to the next, Leica actually took a step back, as quoted here in this review by Jack Newbert in the fall 1990 issue of Outdoor and Travel Photography magazine. Unlike the R5, the Leica R6 is principally mechanically governed. The R5 comes complete with several auto exposure modes plus manual, but the R6 has only manual exposure control, with shutter speeds ranging from 1 second to 1 1,000th of a second. Another review in Outdoor Photographer's October 1989 issue by Deborah Davis sums up the purpose of the camera the best. In this day of electronic-laden auto-everything cameras, there is a new product on the market that stands apart from the rest. Welcome to the Leica R6. Designed to appeal to the photographer who wants a mostly mechanical, manual camera, the R6 shuns current trends and offers a back-to-basics approach to photography. This three-page special advertising section titled The Shot of a Lifetime features three Leica cameras, including the R6. The main photo was taken during a Mount Everest climb with an R6 by photographer Warren Thompson. A camera which could be disabled by a failed, inexpensive battery would jeopardize the photographic mission, says the ad. The next page claims that the R6 can withstand temperatures as low as minus 4 Fahrenheit and as high as 140. Something that made me chuckle was this quote up top. 
If Michelangelo were alive today, he wouldn't be painting, he'd be using a Leica. I guess we'll never know. This Leica R6 ad titled Seduction gives a really nice top-down look of the camera. You're irresistibly drawn to it, seduced by the beauty, the precision, the mystique of legendary performance. Unlike mere cameras, you don't just hold a Leica. You, you caress it and feel the perfect balance, comfortable fit and smooth positive operation, an extension of your hand, your eye and your art. You'll be starting an affair with excellence that will last a lifetime whether you choose the manual R6, the electronic R5 or the fast handling RE. Settle down there Leica. <laughs> During my research for other videos, I've come across quite a few Leica ads and I have to say many are like this one. And there's a reason that some Leica owners have, shall we say, a superiority complex. If you wanted to be seduced by this all manual beast, you better take out a second mortgage because with a 50 mm f1.4, this Everest climber will cost 5550 USD in 1991 or wait for it, 11,147 in 2021 money. These days though, you can get one for a respectable 600 USD. That Summilux 50mm f1.4 will still choke your wallet though at a cost of 12 to 1800 bucks. Number 4, the Nikon F4S. Sliding in at number 4 is the Nikon F4S. I'm always curious to know the differences between models with slightly different names, and in my Top Cameras of 1982 video, I was wondering what the big deal was between the Nikon F3 and the F3 HP, and the answer was basically a viewfinder. Here I was again, curious what the difference between the Nikon F4 and F4S was, and the answer may amuse you. A battery pack. What makes an F4 and F4S is the MB21 battery grip that takes six AA batteries, and that's about it. You get a beefier camera and a slightly higher frames per second burst rate. With the MB21, you can turn any F4 into an F4S. It's a little sneaky on Nikon's part, especially since it's got its own advertising campaign. Here are a couple of examples. The first here says, the reasons, and brackets the S. And another example here, it brackets the ES in lenses. An odd choice. You'll notice all the ads for the F4S include the battery grip, because it has to. Regardless, the Nikon F4 was a revolution for Nikon. They plunged into autofocus and while everyone else was remounting their cameras, Nikon stayed true to their user base by allowing older manual lenses on their newer autofocus cameras. Number three, the Canon EOS One. Getting the bronze medal for today's top 10 is the other autofocus revolution flagship, the Canon EOS One. Announced in 1989, the EOS One was not Canon's first EF mount camera, but the first flagship model. As you can imagine, many FD mount Canon users were very upset that their cameras were antiquated overnight. History speaks for itself though, and Canon survived the backlash. The earliest ad I found was in September 1989's issue of American Photographer, a colorful three-page ad that would be one of a theme of ads with the suggestion to, quote, shoot it hot, live for photography, eat, sleep, and breathe it, become a photograph, send the world your message, written in silver. I did a full history on the EOS One in my segment, This Old Camera, and I'll leave a link in the description. After I released that video though, my Patreon patrons and I were making shoot it hot jokes for weeks. It's so incredibly cheesy and so very 90s. In September 1992, Camera and Darkroom Magazine published A Quiet Revolution, a look at the Canon EOS phenomenon by Mike Johnston. Johnston took an in-depth look at Canon as a company, specifically their transition from FD mount to EOS, the controversy, and resulting innovations. When Canon introduced the EOS line in 1987, they immediately earned for themselves, among other things, a bad rap of sorts. The reason was the lens mount capability. The introduction of the new line was news, and the reaction from those heavily invested in expensive FD optics was swift, loud, and to put it mildly, less than pleased. 
He would go on to say that even if you're not a Canon photographer, it might be wise to keep your eye on them, if only to see which way the winds of change are blowing in the field of 35mm photography. A Canon EOS 1 with a 50mm f1.8 would knock 1939 USD out of your 90s Velcro wallet, or about 3900 today. With an EF28-105 lens, I paid 197 USD for the model I used in my reviews. It wasn't in the best shape though, so expect to pay a little more. Number 2, the Leica M6. Obtaining silver for today's countdown is the Leica M6. Is it any surprise that a Leica made it to the top 3? This review by Deborah Davis in the June 1991 issue of Outdoor Photographer explains the advantage of using a Leica quite well. The M6 allows the photographer to know what's coming into the frame by displaying six distinct frame lines in the viewfinder window. These are projected in pairs corresponding to different focal length lenses for 28 or 90, 35 or 135, and 50 or 75 millimeters. The correct set automatically appears when you attach a lens and includes an area outside the frame line, so you'll be alert to something moving into the photo. In addition, you may manually select a different set of frame lines just by pressing a lever next to the lens. So without actually changing lenses, you can see and decide quickly which lens to use for best composition. The ability to go unnoticed in a crowd is also touched on. The M6 is fast and silent, small and simple, says Davis. And here we go again with the melodrama, using the same ad theme as the R6, except this time it's not seduction, it's obsession. It's an almost unreasonable dedication to quality, meticulous attraction to detail, flawless mechanical precision, incredibly quick, quiet handling, and optics that defy comparison. An obsession with perfection. It's what sets Leica above mere cameras and accounts for their unchallenged reputation and unequaled value. If Jesus was alive today, he wouldn't be a carpenter. He'd be making Leicas. Okay, that last part I made up, but it's hard not to snicker at the hubris of it all. I will give Leica this though. The commitment to only making small changes from model to model is very impressive. Even as they transition to digital models later, the design made very little change. You know that when you buy one and ever feel like upgrading, you can do so knowing that you won't have a huge learning curve ahead of you. The M6 might be second on the list, but it's first in price. With the 50mm f1.4, you can expect to pay $56.85 in 1991 cash. And just to give you a better idea of how much that is, in 1991, you could buy a used 1987 Dodge Omni for less at a cost of just under 5300 So with inflation, an M6 was 11418 in 2021 money. That is just bonkers in my opinion, especially when you consider that these days, you pay for the sensor in a high-end digital camera. But back then, everyone was using the same film. Getting one on eBay is still going to be pricey. Body only is going to be 3 to 4K. Before I announce the number one spot, here are a couple of honorable mentions. Number 1. The Olympus OM-4T Coming in with the gold is a camera you probably didn't expect, the Olympus OM-4T. Maybe some of you did, as last time I made a video like this on the hottest of 1982, lots of you asked where the Olympus cameras were. Uh, the OM-1N came in at 11th place, just in case you're curious. One of the features the OM-4T that caught my eye while reading up on it was the ability to multi-spot meter, as described in this review by Peterson's photographic writer Dan O'Neill in December 1986. Multi-spot metering is done by selecting different areas in the scene and metering each one with the press of the spot button. Up to 8 spots can be metered and averaged by the OM-4T's microcomputer. 
The other big deal with the OM4T is the full synchro flash system. Basically, Olympus uses a focal plane shutter, and that comes with its limits on how fast you can sync a flash to it. While many other manufacturers worked on a better shutter, Olympus just increased the duration of the flash system to properly gather all that light at quicker speeds. A focal plane shutter has two curtains, a leading one and a trailing one, and at higher speeds, the trailing curtain is already closing before the leading one has completed its cycle. So in the case of flash, you get an incomplete flash exposure. Long story short, the OM4T has a max flash sync speed of 1 over 2000, as promoted in this ad here titled, The First Camera Ever to Break the Light Barrier. They also called the multi-spot meter function the most precise built-in meter in camera history. So what does the T stand for? According to David Brooks of Peterson's Photographic, the use of titanium for the body's top and bottom plates. This exotic metal provides both lighter weight and greater strength to protect the camera's internal circuitry to dedicate the new F280 flash and integrate its special new capabilities into the OTF auto flash exposure control, auto spot continuous light metering, and exposure automation. With the 50mm f1.8 lens, the OM4T will set you back 1330 by 1991 standards or just under 2700 by today's. These days you can expect to pay a respectable 3 to 400 body only. And that concludes today's list. Did I miss a camera that should have been on here? Do you agree with the order? Let me know in the comments. And if you like what I do on this channel, please consider joining me on Patreon, where I offer early access, free prints, and exclusive videos. I also have a monthly newsletter with a giveaway each release, and a Discord with a vibrant community. Links to those in the description. And until next time, stay classic.